These are your notes for Community Ecology, chapter 54. Last time we talked about populations, populations group of individuals of the same species. Now what we are going to talk about is communities, basically all the living organisms in an ecosystem, the interactions between all the living organisms. And again, remember, not only includes the animals, includes the plants, includes the fungi, includes the bacteria and protista in the soil, includes everybody in an ecosystem. So all the organisms together all the organisms together and of course when you have all these many species interacting they are gonna be interactions among all of them not all of them with a happy ending before we start with those interactions at uh, the level that we need to we need to introduce two concepts that are related to the idea of competition Remember when we have more than one species, they are going to be competing for many resources and not all of them are going to get what they want. So one important concept is the concept of niche. And the niche is really the ecological role of an organism and includes not just where it lives, but where it does, how it reproduces, many other aspects. Niche is not the same thing as habitat. So please do not confuse that. It's not the same thing as habitat. The best way to, address, to show you this is with a specific example. If you have ever been to the beach or the coast, east or west coast, you have seen that in the rocks or in the pylons of uh, piers, there are these little creatures that are called barnacles, that are called barnacles that are growing there. You also might know that in the ocean there is the high tide, that is the highest level. Then there is the low tide, the lowest level. And in between, this is what we call the intertidal. And depending on the area of the world, this area of the beach experience uh, several times, two times a day in our coast here, twice a day, the, the, our, the water goes out, comes back, and then again goes out and comes back. So twice a day, the organisms that live in this intertidal area are without water and they are exposed to air. That's a very important consideration because in order to survive when they are exposed to air, they're going to need some specific adaptations to, pre to prevent dehydration. Now, if you look closely at these barnacles that live in the coast, you're going to see that always, no matter where you are, you can tell where the low tide is because there is a clear separation between two species of barnacles. This species here, Tamalus, you always find it right here in the intertidal area, the area that it gets exposed to the uh, air. And the other species that is slightly bigger, Semibalanus, you always find it below the low tide, always. And so even if you have no idea about the tides, you can tell where low tide is because you can see the break in between the distribution of the two species. Next time that you go to the beach and you go to a pier or a rocky area, please pay attention to this because you will see it. So you would assume that these barnacles live there and these live there and that's it. However, it's very interesting. If I go to the beach and I scrape these barnacles out of here, remove them, totally remove them. Of course, these guys have a, a planktonic larva that has to settle in the rock, just like we talked before with the oysters. Uh, these also have a planktonic larva. That's how they get here. So if I scrape these ones and clear this area, guess what happens? These species actually can take over and occupy the whole area. These species here actually can take over and occupy the whole area. 
if I scrape and prevent these ones from being here. If I do the opposite experiment, I'm going to scrape these ones and make this area av available for colonization. I scrape those. Guess what happens? Absolutely nothing. These ones can only grow from low tide down. These ones remain in this section. So this is pretty interesting. If these ones are not here, these ones actually can live in a bigger area and do more on the rocks. So what this teaches us is that these two species are in competition. They are competing for the resources, specifically the substrate here. And of course, you can figure out that when these two species are competing for the resources here in the low tide, of course, this species is the winner in low tide. That species is the winner in the below low tide. This one can be everywhere, but it cannot compete against this one. This one is the first one. This one is the second one. All right? So this is very clear. So this is the better competitor. So the only way to learn these things, you know, you can be fooled very easily by what you see. But when you do this kind of experiments of removal of species that are very important, do you get to realize the level of competition that exists between the organisms? Okay, so very specific role that they are going to play in the different areas. And the concept of competitive exclusion is very important. Uh, there is another little concept that has to do with this and is the concept of resource partitioning. One of the main principles when organisms are competing for resources, when organisms are competing for resources, for the most part, they, they actually avoid competition. They actually avoid it. Because when you are competing with resources and you are interacting, that has a cost, an energetic cost. And you would rather be using that energy to do something else. So competing for a resource and have to interact physically with another organism is not the best use of your energy. So what we have discovered is that most organisms do something that is called resource partitioning to avoid direct interaction with each other. So you have here, this is an example from the Dominican Republic. There are a number of anoli species. These are lizards. They are very abundant and there are a lot of species. But if you look at this diagram here, each one of these lizards has a very specific habitat within that area. For example, Anolis ricordi lives in the canopy of the very tall trees. Anolis insolitus, the middle range, Christophei, lower, Cibotes, even lower, Anolis disticus, kind of fencing and areas are uh, impacted by humans. So they are all separating. They, even though they can all go everywhere, they kind of stay in a particular area because then they avoid interacting with each other and wasting energy resources. This is called resource partitioning. You stay there, I stay here, you are happy there, I'm happy here, and we can save our energy for something better like mating. So now that you had a little introduction at competition and how organisms avoid competition because it's a waste of resources usually, uh, let's look at the interspecific interactions. This is going to be a review from your freshman bio. And there are a number of interactions that we want to talk about. First, we have competition. Competition because we, resources are limited, two organisms are going to try to compete. But at the same time, they are going to avoid it through competitive exclusion. Try to minimize that. Competition has a negative cost for both species. It's a negative negative. 
I believe in freshmen with the two, happy, two sad faces. They look angry. So negative, negative. How do we measure the negative? Just think about how you measure the cost of anything. If you have a negative cost, you're probably going to have fewer offspring. Remember, everything has to be in the context of evolutionary significance. Then you have the other one, predation or parasitism. Works the same. Predation and parasitism. One of the organisms has a negative impact and the other one, of course, benefits from it and it has a positive outcome. In predation, the negative is the prey because the prey is going to die and the predator is the one that gets the positive because it gains. In terms of parasitism, the parasite is the positive and the host for that parasite is the negative because it's losing resources. So that's important. And in freshman bio, you learn it as a happy and a sad face. Mutualism, mutualism, both benefit from this interaction. This is one of the best ones, mutualism. And I remember that because I can make two happy faces here with those U's meaning that both of them are positive, mutualistic interaction. One of the more classical ones, lichens, that is an association between an algae and a fungus, or between uh, uh, the bacteria that fixes nitrogen in the soil, nitrogen fixing bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria, and the roots of legumes, roots of legume plants. And hopefully I'll have a chance to show you this in person in class. Finally, we have commensalism. That's another interaction where one of the organisms is it's positively impacted and the other one is kind of eh, doesn't really have a positive or a negative impact. Remember that these positive and negatives are going to have a cost and you're going to either increase or decrease your fitness level because of these creatures. Um, because we all like to look at these beautiful things, here you have some examples, commensalism, some unusual ones, zero and one. These are plants, especially in the tropics, you can also find them in southern United States that lives on top of other uh, on trees. Basically, the plants hang on to the trees there to be high in the canopy. Uh, the plant benefits because it has a substrate closer to the sunlight up. The tree actually, yeah, it doesn't affect it at all because the plant is, these plants are not getting anything from the tree really. You have mutualism, the Nemo and the sea anemones. The sea anemones provide protection to Nemo. Nemo uh, protects the anemone for, from predators. Predation. This is a nice picture. It's a spider eating a butterfly. Something that you are not used to seeing, positive and negative. And, and another unusual parasitism that you might not know about. This is a brown-headed cowbird. We have them around here a lot. Brown-headed, hello, brown-headed, and it's called a cowbird. And what these guys do, they lay eggs in somebody else's nest. So somebody else's raises their chicks and feed them. Talk about being opportunistic. So this is, and usually these are bigger eggs than the other ones. And basically when the chicks hatch, this is a bigger chick and usually gets rid of the other ones and monopolizes all the food that the parents are bringing, which is not this one. Basically somebody other species of bird is raising the kids of this one. Talk about smart parasitism. All right? So, Keep in mind all those and you need to remember those interactions and the signs, figure out a way to remember it. Uh, in the context of evolution, predation actually drives evolution. That's an important concept to remember 
because the parash, the predator and the prey are constantly being selected for for better ways to escape or better ways to catch the prey. So it's what we call an arms race between predator and prey. And just in case, so you get the image of animals, we're always thinking about that. Plants also engage in these kind of things, this kind of behavior, this arm race where they are trying to avoid being eaten. And for that, plants can produce spines, thorns and toxins that are toxic for the animals that they eat. Unfortunately, some of us love to consume some of these toxins. For example, caffeine is produced by plants, coffee, tea and other plants as a way to deter predation because the predator gets uh, very high, very hyper and usually uh, damages or interferes with their nervous system. But we love that sensation. Uh, THC, uh, marijuana, same thing, that's produced by plants, cannabis, as a way to defend themselves from predators. A predator that, a herbivore that eats the plant and gets high is gonna be a dead herbivore because it's gonna be eaten. Cocaine, the same thing, that's also a compound produced by plants to avoid their predators, their herbivores that are eating them. Imagine a herbivore high on cocaine, basically totally unaware of what's happening around it and is easy prey of the predators. So keep in mind, predator-prey interactions drive evolution, but at the same time, organisms, with the help of change over time and mutations, these are some of the things that they can do. Just to remind you again, one of the things that are very fascinating is the idea of camouflage and developing a cryptic coloration that allows them to blend with the environment. Natural selection favors those colors that are not caught all the time and that is camouflage, it's easier to disguise. Similar, we have the concept of mimicry where you don't look like the environment but you look like other less desirable organisms. An example of that we have here, one of these is a monarch butterfly. One is a monarch butterfly, the other one is a viceroy butterfly. The monarchs are toxic and nasty and not good for eating. So the birds learn very early not to eat these monarch butterflies that are toxic. So if a bird sees this other one, this is the viceroy butterfly, the bird, what is the instinct? I'm not going to come and check closely at the venation of the wings to identify. The bird is like, oh no, I'm not eating those. So by mimicking, again, it's a process of natural selection, mutations. If you, the similar, the more similar you look to a toxic species, the organisms, your predators are not going to eat you. It takes millions of years and a lot of selection, 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 until you achieve the beautiful mimicry that you have here. So camouflage, mimicry, ways of predators or prey to avoid predators. Now, also sometimes the advertise, advertisement, advertising how undesirable, how dislike, distasteful you are. And that just in case, you don't, probably don't need to remember this, it's called aposematic coloration. But every time you see bright organisms, for the most part, it means that they are poisonous, that they are toxic. And it's a way for them to say, hey, eat me at your own risk, basically, because I'm going to kill you if you eat me. So most toxic organisms are brightly colored in nature, except if you are one of those cheaters like the viceroy that is mimicking another one and by that you get protection. Ah, oh, natural selection is beautiful. So, this arms race that I told you between predator and prey because they drive evolution, 
is the pressure is not only between predator and prey but there are other interactions that are also driving evolution into what we call this arms race. The other one is host and parasites. They live together, they de the parasite truly depends on the host, so the host is always in being selected for, for a better immune system so it can get rid of the parasite. And the parasite is always being selected for, for ways to avoid that immune system. So it's a constant, constant race, arms race, into this process. So they drive each other's evolution constantly. And finally, the last one that you are familiar with is flowers and pollinators. They are very specific for each other. And in this case, both of them really depend on each other. Remember that pollen is the male sperm of the, the sperm of the male flowers and it needs to be carried from one plant to another. Uh, some plants use the wind, that's okay, but most plants actually kind of try to use uh, pollinators because it's a sure thing that your sperm is going to get into the right plant and they are very specific and they are the adaptations to get the nectar and the pollen are specific and the relationship between the plant and the organism, the pollinator, are closely tied together. You are familiar with the bees and the flowers. I want to introduce you also to butterflies and flowers as pollinators and bats as pollinators too. This is very, very important. Here I have a beautiful picture, this is a red blood cell and those things inside are the malaria parasites. It's a type of protist that infects your red blood cells. And this is a beautiful arms race in which the parasite has figured out how to trick your immune system to escape detection. So with that I hope you had a quick view of uh, overall of interactions. And I'm going to stop here with the part one to make it a little bit shorter and we are going to come back to talk about communities at a different level, diversity and succession. So I'll see you in a little bit for part two. Thank you for listening. I hope this helped.